Hey, hi everyone, and welcome to this webinar on recalibrating product strategy, addressing demand shifts in existing market. My name is Kumudini, and I will be your host for today. Along with me, we will have Isha from our team to moderate the chat. Today's session, as the topic itself highlights, would focus on how the current situation is demanding change in product strategy. And now I will move on to introduce our speakers for the event. The session will be delivered by two experts from Harbinger's consulting team. So both Bide and Vibhuti Agarwal. Hello everyone, good morning. Vibhuti, you're on mute. So, okay. So hello uh, viewers. I hope I'm audible now. Yes, Vibhuti. Okay. So with that, uh, Subodh heads the product and technology strategy consulting uh, team and Vibhuti Agarwal uh, has been instrumental in creating several engaging and usable experiences in a wide range of software verticals. Joining Subodh and Vibhuti would be our guest speaker and HR tech innovator, Jeremy Tillman, founder and CEO at TrainUp and Knowledge Flow. Hello, Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. Good morning. Nice to have you on our webinar. Thanks. Very happy to be here. So a quick note, uh, as we have three speakers today, uh, the preferred mode uh, to see them together is the side-by-side -side mode option. You will find this under view options setting on the top next to where it says you are viewing Subodh Bide screen. With that, uh, let's get into the presentation. Uh, Subodh, the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Kumudini. And uh, I'm honored to be talking alongside Jeremy and Vibhuti on this presentation. So um, let's get started. What I've done is I've uh, brought up a picture of a beautiful landscape. Uh, this is a corporate headquarters of uh, Nike. And uh, uh, Nike, they were in deep trouble in early part of this year when the pandemic sort of just started worldwide and all the physical stores of Nike had to be sort of shut down overnight. And as a result of that, their sales just plummeted. Nike do have an online store, but that's not one of their premier channels for, for selling goods. And, uh, but then what Nike did was they brought together a bunch of uh, health experts, they got fitness advisors, uh, they got trainers together and uh, had them work in an online mode. They had them give sessions online to different Nike customers. And through this kind of a new channel that they created, they were able to direct uh, new customers, existing customers to their online stores and sort of bring back the sales to near about where they were before the pandemic uh, hit them. Uh, so in this webinar, what we would try to do is see if there are similar strategies that can be applied by uh, software technology companies in order to address certain demands that would uh, be brought upon them. And at the same time, uh, walk through a systematic process of going about this whole recalibration. And uh, Jeremy, since uh, he has joined us in person live, uh, we would love to hear from him as well uh, about his uh, experiences of recalibrating train up and some of the other range of products that he has. So um, let's get going to the next slide, which is like the first part of, uh, of the recalibration is to understand what are the types of recalibrations that are there? So the first type that we have been seeing is when companies, they want to reposition their product in an entirely new market. WhatsApp, which was primarily uh, a B2C kind of an application, they uh, got into a market where they made it like a B2B to C. So they built WhatsApp for business, which business owners started using to reach out to customers. Uh, the second type is where companies uh, take 
build new products uh, and get into markets where there are unmet, unheard of demands or needs. So Amazon and Microsoft, they sort of got into this uh, whole field of uh, cloud management services when it was unheard of 10 years back when data centers were booming. So they saw a need for making simplifying the whole cloud management process and then they built services and product around it. The third kind is around creating more value for existing customers, keeping the existing customers happy, trying to get them to use the products more and more. And one example that I personally love, I'm sure there are like several of these. Uh, so the example I like is Salesforce. They are constantly innovating. They're constantly rolling out new features to the existing market. Some of those are even free of charge. They don't charge more for that. So uh, an example is this lightning user interface that they launched a couple of years back, which sort of revamped the entire product usage experience. And the intention was to, since the generation of sales force or the generation of salespeople has now moved on and millennials are coming in, they wanted to have a more uh, touched up and a better user interface. And then there is a fourth kind where uh, the existing market demands for certain new things. It's, it could be either because of situation, it could be either because of newer trends that are appearing. Uh, the example that we have is Paychex. Uh, they, you, they did time and attendance using a lot of endpoint solutions like thumb biometric scanners, retina scanners that were placed at the entrance door of offices. But when the workforce moved into their houses or when the workforce moved remote, it was hard to keep track. And then Paychex brought a solution where they had apps that could do geofencing. They, there were apps that could track location and then record similar information in their database. So they saw that there was a shift in demand and then they addressed it with, a, with, a, with something new. Uh, now these were not just four randomly placed blocks, but if you look at them, uh, if you put an X axis to it, where you put different phases of a product and Y axis you put uh, different markets that are there, different stages of market, then you get a two by two matrix. And this is something where which CEOs, product designers, product owners can place their strategy around. So they could lie in one or more of these quadrants, depending on their business situation, depending on the, on the market situation. So uh, what I'll do is uh, we'll roll out a quick poll to all of you that sort of uh, try to visualize the next two quarters of your business. And uh, if your product and services, they need to be recalibrated, which of these quadrants uh, would you focus the most, which are the most important ones? And I think the poll that Kumudini will roll out is a multi-choice uh, poll. So you can select more than one option. Uh, Kumudini, can you roll that out, please? I think she will keep it active for maybe uh, 30 seconds or so, so that all of you get a chance to uh, vote on that. And the poll results would be visible to you as soon as the poll ends. So Kumudini will bring that up in another five seconds maybe. I think we have around 40% uh, people who have voted. Maybe we'll give a couple of seconds more for others to vote. I hope uh, you are able to see the poll. At times, uh, Zoom takes some time to uh, bring up such interactions. Okay, um, fair enough. I think we have around 60% vote and maybe uh, we can uh, start end the polling and, um, and show the results. Okay, so um, uh, it seems like uh, all of you have thought of different ones. Uh, option three, which is about uh, creating more value to existing customers is the most important aspect of, uh, of recalibration. And at the same time, uh, 
number one and number four uh, also seem to be getting good number of votes. So uh, what I would, uh, I would request Jeremy to, uh, to sort of share his thoughts on how he visualizes train up uh, strategizing their recalibration needs. Uh, what are his thoughts on this matrix? Great, thank you. It's funny, as I look at this from a perspective of a CEO uh, and an entrepreneur, and also uh, from a product manager's perspective, I think all four of these options each have their own level of, of viability. You know, our business, our flagship product is trainup.com. It's a career training marketplace where we primarily uh, match training seekers to training opportunities. So a lot of our users are registering for live training in uh, in their in their markets uh, where where they live or where they want to go for their for their training and some of our past products are your traditional learning and performance management type of, of products and as we had already begun preparing and working with Harbinger and the product teams there to to really rethink and recalibrate our products and you know I met in person there in in January as we began that process and then COVID hit in full and in our business, you know, primarily from a live training business um, was down around 80% overnight uh, to no fault of our own. So we had to look at all these options. And as we looked at option one, reposition your, your product for a, a new market, your learning was already a large market and every customer, uh, every company could use our product. In fact, we've had over 60,000 companies purchase training from trainers.com over the years. And so it wasn't so much uh, that option for us. Uh, option two, build a new product for an unmet need. I think that that was something we heavily considered because there was a lot of new needs that were evolving out of COVID. One of the things you have to consider when you bring in a new product is how much time it takes to bring that product to market. Uh, what are the ramifications of that? Is it something for that particular need or something that you see being a long-term need and not just in response to what was happening with, with COVID? And we, we considered a lot of that and option three, uh, creating more value for existing customers, as that was number one on the poll, you can imagine most companies immediately began to think about that and most products. How can we make our product better? How can we serve our customers better? Because companies are fighting to hold on to their existing customers. I think you're going to see that in the large HR tech market. Companies may not be adopting new solutions as rapidly right now, but they are for sure looking to create value. And I think that every product company in and organization need to consider that. For us, option four is where we landed and where we spent most of our energy and effort, and that's addressing the shift in demand from existing customers. I mean, if we're honest, none of our customers, primary customers, can go to a live training event in their city or even around the globe because of, because of uh, COVID-19. And so the move for virtual live was a very swift move. Many of our providers and partners have for years never conducted virtual live training. So we had to quickly adapt our product to do that. And for us, one of the biggest shifts that we made was introducing a, a learning center. We didn't want to respond to our customers by saying, hey, go and buy more training from us. We wanted to respond with something that we could give them. And so we developed a, a learning center based on our new training flow technology that we had already begun to work with Harbinger on to give users not only access to a lot of great content at no cost, but to give them an interactive, a new way uh, to collaborate and learn together. And so we really fit in between that option two and that option four, quickly addressing the shift in demand, but also presenting something new. And the response has been great for us uh, in, that, in that process in our, in our learning center, the response has been great. And again, we're working on new products through our knowledge flow you know, platform, and we've really had to shift tremendously to address the, uh, the needs that are changing of our customers. Uh, superb. I think, Jeremy, you sort of gave it the CEO's touch to the whole matrix and you sort of uh, deciphered it in your way in, uh, in the sense that you would look at it. I'm sure uh, all the attendees uh, would devise their own ways um, considering what, what you have uh, shared. So uh, let's move to the next uh, part of this. So uh, once we have understood in which direction a company wants to in terms of their strategy. The next aspect would be to understand the need for recalibration. And I think Jeremy very well mentioned that uh, the biggest problem for his product was that because of COVID, 
physical classrooms just wouldn't happen. And there was a need for quickly doing something about it. So what I've done is I've listed four prominent needs that uh, we have been uh, receiving requests from customers about it. I'm sure there would be several such needs. So the first one is uh, uh, products or product owners, they want to take their service delivery into a contactless mode. Uh, people are worried that they don't want to go out, they don't want to get into a physical classroom or in an office. Students want to stay indoors. So how can the whole experience be contactless running in a virtual world? Uh, and the second one is sort of an output of the first one that once you put uh, the users in a remote environment or they start working from different locations than from where they were supposed to, they start uh, coming up with newer challenges. They start exhibiting different behaviors that product designers haven't even anticipated. So uh, that's one challenge that we have seen, um, seen come up very prominently in, uh, in some of our conversations. The third need, uh, it is, it is like a dilemma that, uh, that CEOs have asked us that, uh, how is typically the price versus volume metrics adjusted? So if, uh, if my business is going completely online, if it's going remote, then do I drop the price point uh, because I'm anticipating an increase in volume or if the vo volume in, is gonna increase, then would it also drive up my let's say the cloud execution costs, or should the price remain the same? So that is, uh, those are some of the questions that they have around the price versus volume metrics. And then the fourth kind is around evolution of newer ecosystems. So uh, all of us work in separate ecosystems. There is an office ecosystem, there's something at home, but now new products are sort of getting into it. So robotic process automation would get into organizations where redundant tasks need to be automated. Uh, augmented reality-based solutions might become more prominent in classrooms, uh, especially when the learners are working from or learning from home. So those are some of the aspects. And uh, before this webinar started, uh, Jeremy was sort of talking about how collaboration apps are becoming more and more important and they're making their way into this these ecosystems. So uh, Jeremy, uh, maybe we should hear it from you in terms of how you are thinking about uh, uh, on the collaboration apps. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the challenges that's emerged from the, um, the heavy remote work that we're seeing is that we have to engage differently. Um, everyone's sort of getting zoomed out in a sense from going on Zoom for your meetings and what's happening is that people aren't collaborating the same way. You can't go and sit in a, the lunchroom. You can't go into someone's office. You can't go and have a team sync in the same way that we're used to. And what's happened is learners, employees, users just aren't sure how to respond. So the need for collaboration apps has only increased. Uh, tools like Slack um, and, and other tools are, are rapidly, Microsoft Teams has seen an incredible boost so I believe there's a really unique opportunity for product creators and for CEOs to really think about is what's the next wave of collaboration look like and how can your product be a part of that solution? Because it's not going away. We're changing our behaviors fundamentally. So even when offices open back up, people are going to be used to collaborating in this new way. And if we can provide great products to do that, we think there's an, a great opportunity out there for organizations and product uh, creators. For us at, at Train Up and Knowledge Flow, the, our entire knowledge flow framework is about how do we learn together? How do we collaborate? How do we connect together? And so it works really great for a remote world or uh, in a traditional, traditional office space. So we're excited to see the need that has in, and demand that has increased for that. But I think the opportunity is pretty vast for organizations all over to really uh, key in on that particular area. I think that's spot on and it's so true that it's very likely that some of the collaboration apps might become like a new interface for, for some of the products where literally you interact or get things done to the collaboration platform itself without logging into that particular system. So we'll see how uh, collaboration apps, uh, how they exponentially increase in their popularity. 
So uh, let's move to the the third part of this uh, this whole recalibration uh, journey, and uh, the obvious question in our minds is that so far we have understood that I need to recalibrate something. I know why I am do I need to recalibrate with all those gaps that we mentioned. Uh, the question is that. Is there a systematic way of doing it? Is it something that just gets done overnight? You flick a switch and boom, your product is changed. Or do I need to sit on the drawing board for like six months to recalibrate? So uh, the answer is neither. There is, there is a systematic process in which it can be done. And especially when uh, um, Harbinger gets such kind of uh, questions around recalibrating and strategy. We use a very uh, simple business model canvas to begin with. So we have uh, customers, we interview them, we understand how their business works. Uh, and the, I think most of you know what business model canvas is. Uh, it's a very nice tool to depict an entire business operations on one single piece of paper. Uh, and then several conversations can come up through that. And then through this, we try to identify the potential areas where recalibration is required. And once we understand what these areas are, then um, our consultants, they actually have certain frameworks that they have built to address very specific problems in those areas. And uh, I've just listed a few of them on this slide. I'm not going to explain through each one of them. But an example is if for a product, uh, partners are a key, like if they are the main who either contribute data, who either contribute technology, then there has to be a strong integration strategy, maybe using APIs, maybe using data sharing, making sure that the data remains secured and so on. And similarly, uh, another demand that we are hearing quite a lot is the product, it has a lot of unused data. And uh, is there some meaningful way, is there some intelligence that can be built around that data? So that way the product can be evolved further. And in, in cases where the data is controlled or is owned by the technology itself, can the data be even monetized? Can there be certain reports being created? Can it be used for creating certain value added features? So our consultants, we sit along with these customers and understand uh, what exactly they are doing on the data front. And the third major aspect is related to customers. I think virtually no business can run without customers. And uh, the more we adhere to the way customers want to use the product, the products they get built in a more solid way. So uh, Vibhuti and our team, uh, they use a lot of design thinking frameworks to build uh, value added features into the product to create new channels. And in some cases, uh, they actually do a, an exercise called as journey mapping, where uh, the customer's journey of using the product of the entire experience that they get uh, from point A to point B, it could be either on the usage side, it could be on the buying side and so on. Uh, that gets applied and inferences from those actually make it to the product design. So uh, since uh, both Vibhuti and Jeremy are here, I would request them to share their experience of the exercise that they did in uh, January this year, where they actually uh, ran us they actually worked out a journey map. And uh, Vibhuti, if you can share uh, your thoughts on, uh, on how the process went, and Jeremy, if you could uh, explain us what were the outputs for uh, Portfino. Yeah, so both, uh, so in fact, uh, this scenario makes uh, journey mapping more important than uh, ever, as the user needs have drastically changed. And uh, it being an important design thinking tool, I think it was very helpful in this recalibration phase. Uh, through journey mapping, uh, we can visualize how different personas interact with the product. Uh, it helps us to see the product from user's standpoint, and hence it fosters a more user-centric approach uh, to the whole product design. So uh, as you see in this picture, while working uh, with Jeremy, we use this method um, for creating uh, customer groups. 
and mapping their journeys. Um, we use this framework to build a learning community where users uh, not only do continuous Okay, I think we uh, lost Vibhuti's uh, voice. Uh, I think I'm back. Uh, I have a very choppy network. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, Vibhuti. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I was just talking about this exercise that we did with Jeremy. Uh, that was uh, when he visited us personally. And uh, later in uh, the March, April timeframe, we had to suddenly switch gears and move to building a different community platform, which was for the churches. The previous analysis still helped us in expediting the conceptualization uh, because uh, I think I would say because both the products still revolved around community building. So we did this exercise for uh, the learning community and then later we also worked upon uh, the community platform for the churches. So there were various changes though. For example, attending sermons instead of trainings and pastoral introductions instead of um, instructor instru introductions and many more like that. So I think the journey Okay, I'll continue from where I left. So the journey mapping for the learning community also changed as core training methods transitioned from the classroom to the web. So uh, I feel that uh, from learning to faith community, the overall journey of journey mapping was really interesting and useful. Uh, in fact, it would be nice to ask Jeremy here. Uh, Jeremy, what do you think? Uh, how did this benefit the product recalibration phase according to you? No, that's great. Um, for us, this time that we shared together in the journey mapping exercise that we went through laid the framework for our product. And it also allowed us to pivot and recalibrate quickly. Had we not went through this process together and really looked at um, all the user centric approach and looked at the admin approach and, and really went through this journey together, there's no question we would not have been able to respond as quickly. And we were able to respond by building out uh, a, a, a next gen learning community for our customers to engage around business continuity and um, productivity and time management as we uh, as we see here and we actually launched this uh, as a free a free solution that anyone can visit now but we also in the midst of this process we interface with several large churches uh, in our area and we always wanted to take our our technology and make it available uh, kind of in the nonprofit and, and church world we just weren't expecting how fast the demand would, would change. And what happened is most churches could not go to church in person, so they had to begin having services online. One of the things they faced was that when you go online to watch a service online, the interaction, the collaboration, the engagement just isn't quite there. Maybe in that moment on Facebook Live, but afterwards it falls apart. And so we're able, to, we're developing and pivoting to develop this new community specifically for churches that allow them to engage around sermon-based content or small group-based content. And so we took that tech and all the journey mapping and we began to quickly recalibrate and think about that for a new audience. And we're working uh, obviously hand in hand with Harbinger now to bring that to life. And at the same time, we were able to expedite the development for this learning center so that we can bring it to our customers immediately and give them a way to engage and share their stories of how this content is impacting them respond to poll questions and discussion questions as we all need to connect and collaborate uh, in the midst of everything that's happening in our world. And so that journey mapping time was critical to allowing us to recalibrate and pivot quickly um, in order to provide a solution. Uh, totally, I think Jeremy, that was, uh, I think that was well-timed and uh, uh, I think it it only goes to show uh, how such well-designed uh, tools and frameworks can give you better clarity in terms of how you want to quickly switch gears and uh, focus more on the business part of it and worry less on uh, on whether the product care is agile enough maybe to uh, to be used in a completely different setup over here. 
All right. Uh, let's let's move to the towards the last part of uh, of this webinar, and uh, just to summarize what we have seen so far. So uh, recalibration, uh, what we have seen is it's not a one-time process, and I think uh, Jeremy explained us very well that you cannot just think of it as one cell on that two by two matrix. You have to think uh, around. So. Uh, understanding the the need for recalibration, understanding the different types of recalibration, that becomes very important. And once these things are known, it's very important to create an actionable plan out of it. Because without that, uh, it it's just going to remain at a thought process, at a thought level, and it might not even make it to the product. So use of these frameworks to define the actual recalibration strategy, and then executing it and managing it. Uh, through its different phases and then eventually taking it to the market. So uh, this is what we sort of summarize and call it as the recalibration journey. And uh, uh, we sort of iteratively go through, it, go through it several times and perhaps uh, in the next year or so, because of all the uncertain times, we might, may need to do this even more often than, than we might would have done uh, in normal times. So uh, with that, we can uh, open up for, for Q&A from the audience and understand uh, uh, how they felt about this webinar and if there are any specific questions that uh, all of us can answer. And uh, uh, I think uh, Isha has also put in uh, the email ID of the consulting group in our chat. So if, if you have any questions that may come up later, uh, you can feel free and email us on this link and uh, uh, we would get back to you with the next steps on that part. So uh, Isha and Kumudini, over to you for uh, telling us what the questions look like and you can tell us who is the right person to, to take those up. Yes, uh, sure, Subodh. So uh... I think we have our first question, uh, which I feel is directly for uh, Jeremy, uh, which asks, says, how can I use Learning Center for a team of 15 members? It's a great question. Well, first off, the Learning Center is public and it's available to anyone and everyone at, at any time. What's interesting is that before we launched that public Learning Center, in the journey mapping exercise we did with Harbinger, the intent was for it to be centered around teams and centered around organizations to be able to develop your own private uh, learning communities so that you can begin to engage and learn together and share insights and information within your company structure so that the learning wouldn't remain siloed, which is one of the, the things that we wanted to address and problems we wanted to solve was allowing organizations to be able to learn together in groups and in teams. And I think with the push towards remote and what we're experiencing now, the need to learn together is greater. So even though the learning center is open to everyone, we have the capacity at train up to develop uh, private learning communities for your organization, whether that's a team of 15 or um, even even larger groups to facilitate that collaborative learning uh, experience. Yes, thanks, Jeremy. Um... I see there's one more question uh, which uh, Vibhuti might want to answer, uh, which is asking about the journey mapping uh, that you did uh, remotely. So it says, can we do journey mapping remotely with stakeholders as in-person collaboration is difficult in this current scenario? Um, yes, uh, in fact, there are many uh, online customer journey mapping tools that help us in elaborating the different stages of the journey mapping. Uh, you know, but just that we have to remember that as part of the design thinking, the main aim should be to strike a balance between uh, what users desire, uh, what's viable for the business, and uh, what's technically feasible. So if, uh, you know, we strike a balance between these three, uh, any tool would Okay, I think uh, Vibhuti was trying to say that with the help of uh, some tools, uh, this is, uh, you know, carrying out journey mapping is uh, possible. Right, Vibhuti? Yes. You know, I'll okay. jump on that as well. And I'll just say that 
it absolutely is possible because we're doing it, um, you know, as we speak and as we've had to re recalibrate for our, our, um, our products. It was a big fear of mine. You know, obviously, I think for a lot of organizations, it's just that fear in general that you have teams all over the world, uh, teams that aren't physically with you, maybe not even on the same time zone. How do you make it all work? And we've, you know, developed a great rhythm with Harbinger now with all the teams. And so, you know, we break our projects up and the journey mapping the things from a design perspective and development perspective and in, in the UX and in all the journeys and we make it work. And there are a lot of tools out there that help uh, that process to, to be seamless and to share data and information. And so leveraging those tools are great as well. But I think it comes down to that intent to really want to make sure that your product that you're delivering and you're taking the time to go through those. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, get, we want to get in a rush, but I believe that taking the time to really go through these processes are, are really important for helping the products to um, really meet the need when you actually get them to the market, but also understanding in a true agile way that you're going to have to reiterate and, and constantly and go back to the table to improve along the way. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I see one more question, which uh, is like, uh, I have an employee engagement product. Can Harbinger help me with consultation on post-COVID changes? Uh, maybe, Subodh, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, Kumudini, sure. Uh, so, yeah, the answer is uh, definitely. Uh, and Harbinger, we do specialize uh, on uh, on HR learning as well as healthcare. So we uh, we have consultants, we have technology experts, we have uh, architects who can look at the specific problems that would arise, especially in a situation post pandemic, and uh, work with uh, work on such uh, aspects. So uh, the answer is definitely yes, and uh, uh, I think. The email ID is already known to everyone, so uh, you could write to us on that email ID post the webinar. Sure, support. So uh, I see there is one more question: uh, Is telehealth recalibration need? What is happening over there? Uh, this might go for uh, Vibhuti. Hi, Vibhuti, you're there. Uh, Subodh, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I think Vibhuti, uh, the location from where she's joining in, there is some kind of a severe weather over there. So that must be affecting the connectivity. So uh, yeah, telehealth, uh, I think, uh, is, is a very fascinating aspect. And uh, this whole remote experience, it's not just remain limited to learners or to employees, but even patients and doctors, they are worried about going to a clinic or a hospital. So we would remote telehealth or uh, video-based conversations with doctors and performing triaging remotely. Uh, that will That is a type of a uh, recalibration. And I'm sure uh, uh, there would be good innovations that, that would happen in that space. Yes, Okay, so uh, I see uh, one more question coming up, uh, which is saying, how do we engage with consulting group and what's the process ahead? Uh, I think, uh, again, so both for you. Uh, sure, sure. So uh, as far as uh, engagement is concerned, it all begins with, uh, with the understanding what the pain points are then we have our lead consultants work with these customers, uh, understand it slightly at a more depth and build our own understanding about the problem areas. And then the lead consultants, they work with specialists like Vibhuti and uh, some of the consultants who are, whose pictures are appearing on the, on the slide and come up with a very custom solution for, uh, for the problems that, uh, that they are looking into. And then beyond that, uh, that custom solution is made more actionable. Uh, so that way it can make its way into the uh, product design. So that's how usually the consulting assignments to flow. Okay, so both. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, in the interest 
of time uh, maybe you will take uh, uh, you know the other questions maybe uh, via email we'll get back to the ones who have requested us uh, for those questions and uh, let me just uh, you know thank you jeremy for joining us today and all our participants for taking their time out for today's webinar uh, we hope it was an insightful session uh, we will arrange a, a webinar recording uh, you know to be sent across to you uh, in case you have any follow up questions uh, please drop us a line at consulting at harbingergroup.com that isha has already posted in the chat window and uh, of course we would be more than happy to answer them for uh, you so wish you all the very best of health stay safe and uh, i will just keep the session on for a few more minutes uh, if anyone has any questions just feel free to drop them drop them in the question box and we would address them online thank you everyone